I didn't expect to actually dance coming on the stage. <laughs> but I could do a bit more of that because I do actually like dancing. The lights are really glaring in my eyes. Um, I'm just going to try and find a position where I don't have the reflections. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here, Morella. Where are you? Hi, thank you very much. We were actually, um, this came about because we were having breakfast together. Um, and I do a lot of work around the global and the domestic women's space because I actually don't think we talk enough about the role of women in any space. And so as um, somebody who's journeyed through this, I thought we might do a little bit of a journey and you have a little bit of my story and then you'll see why I am the way I am. And I'm not making any excuses for it, because I think that we are all capable of going into a place and disrupting it totally. So I want to congratulate you, Morella, for this wonderful event. To all of you for coming, because you all think it's really important to be here. And like she said, hope you take something away with you that you will actually then utilize to make not just a change for yourself, but a change for those around you. And we can't change things if we're not prepared to get up and put our head above the parapet. So let me start. I was born in India. Um, I was nine, ten months when I came to this country, and I'm extremely grateful of being here in this country because I'm not sure what the outcomes would have been had I stayed in India. It may have been better, I don't know. But what I do know is that growing up, I saw two things. One, my gender was an issue. And secondly, the color of my skin was an issue. And you have to recognize that they are going to be blockers if you allow them to be blockers. Or you take, or you take it away and you say, well, what do we do to change things? And I remember as a teenager, and of course, I can see very young faces here. So, you know, this was a long time ago. The world has changed a lot, but actually, having said that, I'm going to then counter that bite, but it's not changed enough. And as growing up in the 60s and 70s in this country, racism was rife. And so you had to tackle that. But also, the laws of the land didn't protect women's rights. So it wasn't until the mid-70s that we actually got something anywhere near to what equality looked like. So I want to put it in that context of why I am the way I am. So my father was a very, very conservative, traditional Indian man. And he saw the roles of girls very specifically, that this is what they do. And then he saw the roles of boys specifically, as this is what they are expected to do. And what you found was that there was high ambition for boys to go into business, into the professions, and there was very low ambition for the girls to do very much. However, when you're 50% of your parent, you actually then start questioning, well, why can't I? Because 50% of me was my father. And, you know, if every time he told me to stop doing something, I'd ask why. I think he used to get irritated with me, and I used to turn around and say, well, actually, that's the 50% of you that's asking you the question. And I think we st start to have the conversation about why we are the way we are. Now, you're all here because, one, it's great to network. But when you've networked, what do you do with that network? Do you follow up? Do you call the people you've met, the new people you've talked to? Do you try and build wider alliances? And that's what I've done. I've spent a lifetime building networks and alliances. And I can tell you the best networks and the best alliances are when you go into a room, know nobody, and you come out with at least two or three new people you've met. But then you have to build on that relationship. And I think the difference between the way we network and then follow up and the way men network and follow-up is completely different. But we don't have to be like them, but we just have to learn the benefits from them. And as a person who did her first business at 19, and I did it at 19 because my father would not let me go to university, so I set up a business, 
in opposition, in competition to him. Because he said, because he said, you've got to get married. So he took me out of my A-levels, got me married, which was great. I've got a phenomenal husband. 45 years later, we're still together. But my husband said to me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, don't ask that question because you might not like the answer. And he said, no, no, what do you want to do? And I said, all I want to do is be me. That's all I want to do is be me. I'm not very tall, as you can see. So I have to be loud. <laughs> People need to know I'm in the room. So he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to show my dad that a girl can run a business just as good, if not better, than men. So I did. I knew about high fashion because I'd grown up in it. And so I knew about manufacturing because I'd grown up in it. So I set up a factory. And I think within the first three years, I'd actually outmarketed my father. Because I was a young person and I knew what young people wanted. He was a man, he didn't. And that's the strength we have. We have an understanding of what consumers want. Because we're the biggest purchasers. So when companies do not take on board the lens of a woman, the, the female lens, they actually miss out on a huge amount of potential. So we start to get that discussion going, right? Is why is it that companies that have a really good diverse board do better? Look at their bottom lines. It will demonstrate it to you. They actually do better. Why is it retention rates are often better in those companies? And why is it that the environment of those companies is often much more welcoming, much more accommodating? So there are differences, and they're good differences. And we're not trying to shift the men out of the room. What we want to do is have the men and us in the room so that we can have an environment that actually is collegiate enough to be able to demonstrate success, and yet at the same time, a nice place to be in. Now, leadership, and I think leadership was one of the things Morella wanted us to talk about. Leadership is really important. Just one or two of you, just tell me, what do you think leadership is? What is leadership? Sorry? Inspiring. So, you know, all of, so can you see the complexities of the question? I always think leadership is always good when, when you turn back, there's a whole line of people wanting to be with you. And when you look forward, there's a whole lot of people wanting to learn how they can be part of the team behind you. And I think that is really the way I look at the world. I've done a lot in the gender inclusion space way, way before it became a thing that you have to do. And I had to do it because I'm a female and a female of color, and there were not many places that were available to me to go. And still today, there are not that many places that we feel comfortable and confident enough just to walk in. And we've got to get that out of our heads. What's the worst thing that can happen if you go somewhere where you are the only person that looks like you? You shouldn't never think, I've got to about turn and go the other way. You go in knowing you own the room, because that's the first thing you've got to do. Own the room. And then you go in knowing you've got something to say. How many times have you been to a conference where they say, anybody got any questions? And silence. <laughs> right? So it takes the first person to open the question up. So I always say, here's the thing I do. Because I know everybody thinks it's the most stupid question. So I own it. I've got a question. I know it's the most stupid question. But I'm asking it on behalf of everybody. 
And now I've included everybody in my stupid question. And I think that's what we've got to learn to do. Let's be comfortable with ourselves. You know, I was 40 when I joined active politics. And at 41 or 42, The Guardian said in their paper, the poster girl of the Tory party, wow. At 40, I've suddenly become a poster girl. <laughs> size 16 at that time, I'm a size 18 now. Size 16, five foot two, poster girl at 40. My children had a mega fit. <laughs> However, what it did demonstrate was there is no limitations for me. And I want us all to believe that, men and women, there is no limitations. And it isn't weak to roll yourselves back and allow somebody else to come into your space. It isn't weak to stand aside to pull somebody else up with you. And it certainly isn't weak to say, I don't know. Because what you don't know, you don't know. But you need to know, and somebody standing next to you might know. So the best thing is to say, hey, I don't know. I have spent a lifetime going up to people and saying, hello, I'm Sandy Verma. And they're thinking, oh, really? But Sandy Verma has managed to go from being a little baby born in Amritsar in India to a very middle-class family to coming to this country as a baby to looking at the world, wanting to change it for the better, having suffered racism and genderism and everything else-isms, and ended up in the House of Lords. How did that happen? <laughs> that happens because I believed in myself. If I want to do something, well, it's very difficult to stop me. And I make friends, and I create networks, and I know that when I can't do something, there is a space for somebody else to do it. I make sure that they know that there's a space for them to do it. So let us look at leadership in that way. Leadership isn't about me at the top by myself. Leadership is about me getting there and making sure Everybody else comes along with me on this journey. And when we get there and we're on this journey, knowing the difficulties and the obstacles we've had to overcome, let's not, for crying out aloud, leave those obstacles for somebody else to overcome. So you kick them out of the way. Being in politics has taught me one thing, and I do hope that there are some brilliant people in this room. And for all the malign that politicians get, the majority of politicians are brilliant. They work incredibly hard. But what they are able to do is change things. So if you're not into politics, think about it. But if you don't want to go into it, at least try and persuade the people who are in politics to do something about it. Standing on the sidelines, making huge amounts of money in business is great. And trust me, I've done it. In fact, I'm still doing it because I'm chair of my son's company, who is, we are amongst the largest solar re renewable energy people in East Africa. But I do it because I want good people in the space of making people change policy. And we can only do that if we're engaged. I hope that when you leave here today, and, I, and you know these forums, these places to come together, and thank you to the, the young men I see across the room. It's brilliant to have you here. Because you'll go away and you'll say, do you know what? Amongst the people I met today, wouldn't it be brilliant to have those in my organization? Women are not good at putting themselves forward. Please learn. It doesn't matter if you get rejection or failure. Men get it all the time, too. It's just they don't deal with it like we do. We in, put it inside here and keep it forever. I've just learned that if you just chuck it out, 
the minute it comes in, it's always better. You know, I'm doing, um, well, I think I'm doing a TEDx talk next month. And it's funny because they asked me what would the title be, which I haven't thought about yet. But what I do know is we visualize ourselves in the lens of others. Let's visualize ourselves in our own lens. So when you get up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and you say you're pretty good, you're going to achieve today, own it, believe it, then do it. Failure is not a bad thing. The Americans know that. They like you to fail a few times. It strengthens you. I think my son, I sent my son to America for five years in New York. I wanted him to have a learning curve. He came back with a wife. <laughs> a good learning curve. She's brilliant. I love my daughter-in-law to pieces. Five foot nine. I'm, she towers over me. But the one thing he learned was it doesn't matter if you get it wrong sometimes. Because getting it wrong actually enables you to get most other things right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope in opening this um, wonderful gathering today that you do spend time really, really wanting to know what you're going to get out of it. Because we're all global citizens in the end. We've all got connections across the globe. We've all got connections here in the UK. And I really want to say thank you very much for allowing me to be a tiny part of this wonderful gathering. Because by being a tiny part, I become a part of a wider discussion. And whilst, you know, there's lots of things that we can say and do, we probably won't. So the best thing is, let's try and say and do the most important things to us today. And that is, I hope, making new friends, learning something new, going out there, creating networks, and becoming the best of the best of what you are. Thank you very much.